I'm Dr. Paula Rosen, publisher of Education Update, and it's a special pleasure to be here with CUNY University's new community college president, President Scott Evanbeck. Thank you for taking the time to see us today. So glad you were able to visit our new building. Thanks for being here. Well, it's a pleasure, and of course, maybe it's a special symbol that you are right across the street from one of the greatest landmarks and uh, resources and erudite centers in New York City, the 42nd Street Library, and there are two lions guarding that. And I'm sure President Evanbeck, you will do just as good a job guarding this <laughs> new Going college. Going to try to, and welcoming <laughs> students. <laughs> Absolutely. So the, the name of your new college, and it's a new community college, is called The New Community College. And I'm just wondering, whether you plan to continue with that name, or will the name change? I expect the name will change uh, at some time in the future. Um, we would hope to honor a leader, someone with a strong commitment to education, uh, but I always want to keep the concept new in how we describe our work and how we describe our mission, because we always want to continue to reinvent ourselves and have that be a hallmark of our work. So even when we take another name, will continue to refer to ourselves as a new community college. That's a great mantra and a great philosophy. I know that you are newly arrived from Indiana University, and you've done some innovative and phenomenal things there. I wanted to ask you about some of your initiatives there, and um, what, are some of, what are some of the ways that you have improved student performance and increased graduation rates in, at Indiana U? I think the most important thing that we did there was to have faculty and staff work together to re-engineer the beginning students' um, complete experience. That rather than waiting till the start of school, most of the students would start in the summer bridge program, that, and then when they enter in the fall semester, they had a coordinated curriculum where they took their classes in cohort groups where one of the classes was taught by an instructional team of a faculty member with an academic advisor, with a student mentor, with a librarian helping to plan the class. Then that cohort of students moved to other classes together, writing or psychology, a whole variety of classes, and where that course also included service learning. So as the students got started, they had a coherent curriculum rather than what students often experience is a random set of courses that are not coordinated with one another where they don't know anyone. It was a, commu a commuter campus, low-income, first-generation students in large part. And we knew that we had to structure our work differently so that the students would be welcome, they know that they belong there, and would be able to be more successful. And we saw really good changes in the bottom line through that series of programs. How many years did that program exist? We started in 1995, so it took your a education update started. Hey, right. it was a very important <laughs> year. Our special, our special year. Right. <laughs> and and we had gotten retention up from at one point it was 53 percent, then got up to 62, and then and now it's up to 76 or 77 percent, and we more than doubled the graduation rate, and we could attribute that to what happened with the students in the first year for the most part. So not the second year, although I know you've written a book right. about sophomores, right. uh, a book helping sophomores succeed right. was the name of your book, and that was written in 2009, so it's right. not so long ago, right. but you feel that the first year is more crucial for success than the second year. Right, because if they don't make it through the first year, they won't get to the second year, and so there's been this huge wave led by John Gardner, who used to be at University of South Carolina, to help institutions, faculty and staff, really focus in on the first year. And so that's what we did um, back in Indiana, and that's very clearly what the planning committee envisions for New Community College, to really have a coordinated, thoughtful curriculum in the first year so that students make it to the second year. And then once they're in the second year, um, one of the things that's happened on many campuses is to think, well, we fixed everything in the first year, so the second year will take care of itself. And, and we realized that wasn't the case. 
Now, did you say that the cohort stays together for year one and year two? No. Did I hear you say no, that? no. In the learning communities, the cohort stays okay. together. Um, at New Community College, we will have cohorts that will stay together to some extent over the whole first year. But the, um, back in Indiana, it was just the first semester. So will, the, will there be a core curriculum here at the new community college? There will be. The, all the students will come to a bridge program, three week long program in the summer, where we'll uh, work with them on you know reading, writing, math, but also to talk with them about um, our expectations for what it takes for them to be successful. We'll have a cadre of student mentors who are students a little bit ahead of them in terms of the curriculum, who work with them as peers in supporting their learning. Then in the first semester, the centerpiece of the curriculum is called the City Seminar, which has uh, three components, a uh, reading writing component, a quantitative reasoning component, but the really innovative part is that it will be based on interdisciplinary case studies based upon things about life in New York City. So immigration, um, sustainability, things that are intrinsically interesting to the students that really come to life in this city will be what the students are studying and the curriculum will be integrated so that the things that they're thinking and talking about in the reading writing component will be related to case study as will be what they do with quantitative reasoning. So it's a very innovative approach to get the students engaged in their learning, to have them to be able to take advantage of living in New York City and helping to construct the knowledge, to do some field work. Then their beginning um, uh, math course will actually be a statistics course. And they'll also have a course that we're calling Ethnographies of Work that, that will also be in the learning community in a common curriculum for the students and that one will say um, you came here um, to get a degree to get a job and and we honor the fact that you want to get a degree and get a job and we honor the fact that that's your parents and family members expectation for you we want you to be able to get a job and we want for you to go on and get a baccalaureate degree so rather than acting like that's a dichotomous choice, we'll celebrate with the students the fact that they can get a job with the associate degree and then our degrees articulate with senior college baccalaureate degrees and so students will be able to go right on and get baccalaureate degrees as well. When you talk, when you said the term case history, did you mean legal cases? Did you, did you mean going back into the history of New York City? Will they be exploring some law as well? What, what are some of the things that you um, that? Well, the, the cases that the faculty have begun to develop thus far, one's on immigration. So it's, you know, what is immigration about in um, New York City? Where do folks come from? What have been historical patterns of immigration? And, and it gives such rich possibilities with the curriculum for the, you know, half the people who live in New York City are immigrants. And yes. so, so they can talk with folks who are immigrants if they aren't themselves and as a part of the pedagogy in the class to help it come alive for them. And another one is sustainability. Um, and another is uh, consumerism. To really important issues that permeate the life in New York City, the students will be able to look at through the lens of sociology and anthropology as they're doing writing on um, things related to those topics, as they're reading on those topics, as they are able to go across the street to the New York Public Library and access primary sources, yes. you know, it's going to be terrific. Oh, terrific. Has anyone ever done this before in the city university system or the community colleges? Um, Brooklyn College has fantastic work uh, where the students are doing work on the Gowanus Canal. I went over and met with the faculty to do that project. So I think that the CUNY campuses have done a fantastic job with students being engaged with the city. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do at New Community College is to ramp it up so that all the beginning students have that rich opportunity. Now did you do something similar this in Indiana U? I taught a course for many years called Discover Indianapolis and what we 
did in our first year seminar was to um, center in on the city of Indianapolis. The students all read uh, the newspaper every class meeting. Um, it, they had to um, pick out an article which addressed a social issue in which they had particular interest, uh, write an essay based upon their analysis of that issue, um, and then at the end of the semester they had to write a letter to the editor based upon the series of essays they'd written throughout the semester. So it was a really good way to get them engaged with reading the newspaper, um, centering in on key issues affecting the community. And, and I, my aspiration is that we'll do the same thing here, that students aren't bringing the habit um, of reading newspapers, and it's such a critically important part of being a citizen. Well, I couldn't agree more as a newspaper publisher and in fact, I, I think that you uh, gave weekly assignments uh, using the newspapers, and were they also writing their, they were writing their own they, articles they as well? Were, that's right, that's right. So you correct. had the literacy component as that, well as the reading that's component. That's right. And we had a team teaching the class, so the students uh, turned in the uh, uh, articles and their essays at the beginning of the class. One of us ran out of the classroom and read them and wrote out feedback during the class, so they got them back at the end of class. Because I think one of the issues is so often students don't get feedback. They, they especially don't right. get immediate feedback. Right. You know, I came across an interesting statistic. The community colleges at CUNY have seen a 40% increase over the past decade in terms of student enrollment. And uh, now, well, there are six community colleges. This will be number seven. But now there are 85,000 students at the community colleges. Right. That's enough for a small city. Yeah, the this enrollment is, is burgeoning, right? really particularly in Manhattan. I think that's why the, the CUNY leadership decided that an appropriate location was on Manhattan because, you know, other boroughs have two community colleges and now Manhattan will have two also. Right, exactly. So what do you attribute to this enormous rise in the community college enrollment? I think uh, across, well, around the world there's widening participation in higher education, uh, recognition by family members and uh, young people and returning adult students that they're not going to be able to participate in the economy without some post-secondary education. And, and it, it's burgeoning. And particularly in New York City, so many of the students are low income, first generation, they're immigrants, they represent diversity and you know they're going to define the future of the city. I, there's another interesting quote that I came across and it was your quote actually and it says the model is grounded in not what the students bring to campus but in a design developed to ensure student success. I love that sentence. So what Will that design, and you described part right, of the design, right, the right. core curriculum, is right. that what you meant by the design? Right, to well, it, but also integrated academic support. So, for instance, rather than uh, telling students, um, well, you should go see your advisor. So the students have to find their advisor, who might not be there or who might otherwise be busy. The way we're going to do it is the advisor is going to be part of the instructional team and the student will be in the classroom with the academic advisor every week. And, and rather than telling the students, we'll go, go find these materials in the library, the librarians will help structure the um, syllabus so that students get engaged with primary sources as an integral part of the curriculum. That I think information literacy is a, an incredibly important issue in our society, especially with the you know, the increased use of the web and, and students not having the tools to be able to sort through so much of that information. So part of what will be embedded in the curriculum is careful attention to information literacy so that students can wind their way through that, be able to identify uh, the primary sources and in fact in the first year where students will be required to be here full time, one component of the curriculum is called group workspace. So it's a time when students are here together a couple hours where they're really focused in on working together with the support of others to learn the material. So rather than the typical thing, well I'll take this class and this class and this class 
and maybe fit in this class, the students will have an integrated curriculum where they'll be here a defined set of hours with the same set of students in a common curriculum working in a group workspace where they will support one another. We are very focused now at Education Update on Technology. We've attended many conferences, visited many schools, right. private and public. Um, and now we ourselves are using something called Dropbox, where we can collaborate on articles no matter where we are in the country. Right. Will you be using that kind of a technology collaborative approach to teach the students the different things that are out there that they can use? Absolutely. We have um, our CIO is up in Boston as we speak at a conference on electronic portfolios and one of our important tasks over the next month is to sort out which electronic portfolio will work best for our students which will be a place where they'll be supported by faculty and advisors and they articulate where they've been, where they are, where they want to go, what their career aspirations are, where they'll put samples of their work, whether they will be able to reflect on the work, others will be able to give them feedback, and then at some point, under the student's control, that can be used as a way for the student to tell a story of his or her learning to somebody else, a potential employer, you know, a, a graduate school, but um, I, I think we're going to see an incredible surge in the use of electronic portfolios as a way not only to document learning, but for students to be able to share that with others. I, you also mentioned the word a service component. Can you define that or elaborate on that? Right. The, I think college students have always done community service, you know, like, you know, go out and, you know, help at a, a soup kitchen or, you know, serve the homeless, work in a literacy program. But over the last 15 or 20 years, I've, an incredibly important component of higher education has become service learning, where it's not only doing the service, but it's after the service, the students being asked to reflect upon what they learned as a function of that service. So it's not just doing the work and walking away from it, but it's doing the work in a supportive context and then reflecting on it and being able to describe the learning that you have as a function of doing that service. So I argue that, that the um, implementation of service learning has been kind of transformational for higher education. I think it's, it's, it's a terrific idea because I think certainly it'll be a, a motivation for the students to then continue to do more service. Absolutely. It wouldn't that be the goal? Yes, right? yes. And maybe go into work at nonprofits Absolutely. around the country. Is there anything else that you'd like to say about the new campus and your new role here in New York City? Well, I'd always wanted to live in New York, and I'm glad I finally get to live here. That it's, you know, it's such a vital place. I've been able to visit the other six community colleges, which are fantastic. Um, that they do incredibly good work. Um, they all have strong national reputations. And what I think is exciting is how the, the community the CUNY leadership decided that we ought to distill out what are the best elements of that work, what's the best thinking about um, how to help students be successful, and then on a borough which needed another community college to say we're going to um, open a new community college where there will be singular attention to student success, not to say that other campuses don't do that, but to say that that is our mission to support student success, to be a model where students will be more successful, and then to collaborate with these other fantastic community colleges in culling out what works so that it will be useful to others. So our primary mission is to the students that we will serve, but a secondary mission is to, is to be a place of continuous learning and assessment so that we can share what we've learned with others and hope that that impact can spread. So you'll be share, you'll be collaborating in a sense with the other community Absolutely. colleges Absolutely. in New York City, and I know there's a big conference coming up on community, national community colleges, right. and that'll be held here in New York City. That's right. Will you be participating? I am. I'm on, a, on the opening panel. Eduardo Marti has done a tremendous job of putting that conference together in September. I think right. it's it'll be a up. key event for, for the city. Absolutely. We will be there. Uh, any other comments about uh, how will students uh, be able to enroll if they see this program? 
on YouTube or on our website, educationupdate.com, how do they apply to get in? Um, CUNY has a common application and will be, once we're approved by the governor, uh, will be listed on that common application. Students will indicate their interest. We're going to uh, open with 500 students and the, it will be a challenge to sort out how, you know, predicting what the numbers are because what we always do in, in higher ed is predict what happens this year based upon what happened last year. Well, we don't have a last year. All we know is that in general, the community college enrollments at CUNY are soaring. And so uh, we're not going to select students out. We're not going to be selective. We're not going to take the most prepared amongst the applicants. It's critical that our student body be reflective of the student body on the other um, community college campuses. So we have a research team which has some distinguished uh, researchers from CUNY and from a couple other places actually meeting next week to talk about how we can put things together to make sure that we do have a representative student body, representative of the other uh, community colleges and how we have an admissions process that's equitable but we really need to end up on opening day with 500 students. So will it be by lottery or by yeah. interview? Um, we're, we're going to do interviews, but the interviews are for the students to find out what we're about, about how we're full time, about how we have a limited number of majors, um, about how we have a distinctive approach to the curriculum, so they can make the decision about whether we're the right match for them. It's not us making a decision about whether we're going to admit them. So the interview process is really for the students to gain information about us, then if we um, have many, many more applicants than we have spots, we may have to move to a lottery admission. That's one of the things we'll have to be addressing. Because one of the other things that happens if, is if you take the very first students who apply, um, research suggests that the first appliers are often better prepared than late deciders. And so I don't want us to get in the trap of, of having the first to apply be the ones that we admit. So that's why it's so critical that we have persons who are knowledgeable about all aspects of the admissions process help us make very good decisions so that we do have a representative student body.